The following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Hey folks, Brian Keene here. You know, summer's over. We're entering the fall and then the winter. Halloween's coming up, Thanksgiving, and then of course the holiday shopping season. Speaking of the holiday shopping season, let me tell you about subculturecorsets.com. They've got everything you need for everyone on your list for this holiday season. Clothing, accessories, gifts, books, you name it, they've got it. They sponsor every show on the Project Entertainment Network, including this one. So please give them your business. Visit subculturecorsets.com. Three Guys with Beards, the Project Entertainment Network store, featuring T-shirts, mugs, stickers, the decent more from your favorite Project Entertainment Network podcasts. Ink stains, scribblers rest. The Horror Show with Brian Keane. Why not show your loyalty by wearing a cool product from the podcast group and show off to your friends? It cooks. Armcast. The Mondo Method Monster Attack. Necrocastic. Go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com and click on the store tab for more details. The Liars Club Podcast. Bizarre. The Lunch Ladies Book Club. Matters of Faith. The Project Entertainment Network Store. Stacked with stuff from the best podcasts on the internet. The Curtain Jerkers. Buttercup of Doom. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior. And welcome back once again to Defenders Dialogue. I am uh, one of your hosts, Brian Keane. And I'm Christopher Golden. And you know what I say, Brian, every time. Excelsior True Believers? That is what I say every time. <laughs> but I usually say Excelsior and you say True Believers. Okay, should, should we uh, should we practice that? Excelsior! True Believers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to apologize to our listening audience right now. If I sound uh, wiped out or tired, it's because I am. Uh Mary's Mary San Giovanni's cat woke me up at two o'clock this morning, um, and I'm glad that it did because when it woke me up, I, I realized that uh, Netflix's adaptation of The Punisher had debuted at midnight. So I, I stayed awake all night watching The Punisher, and uh, now I'm paying for it. I saw your post. You'd watched uh, how many? Watched three episodes. I'm uh, yeah, I'm six episodes into it now. It, it's fantastic. <laughs> Well, listen. Um, that's a that's another conversation, but I'm I'm fascinated by uh, by the Punisher um, in, in the sense of uh, of his existence in the Netflix Marvel universe, uh, and especially by you know what the Punisher is and what he means to different people. Right. Um, I think uh, I think it's a very nuanced. I mean. Don't worry, we'll get to the event, the defenders eventually, folks. But since Chris asked, I think it's a very nuanced, multifaceted portrayal. Uh, obviously, they draw a lot from, you know, Jerry Conway's original stories. They also pull quite a bit from, you know, Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon's just seminal run. But what surprises me, uh, you know, writers like Greg Rucka, Dwayne Straczynski, even Tom Piccirilli, they they really humanized that character. Mm -hmm. And you can you can tell that the showrunners drew from a lot of that as well. Um, you know, it, the Punisher is a sensitive character in, in you know, these times that we live in now. Uh, and they treat it as such, but they do not shy away from what the Punisher is either. Um, so you're else, telling me that it's that it's not the story that starts with the Punisher dead and then resurrected to discover that he's now got angelic weapons. No, it's not. It's not. That. It's not. It's not your version. <laughs> That's so weird. I can't. I don't understand why they wouldn't have done that version. Everybody loved it so much. <laughs> 
you know, all the, the, we've been friends 20 years. I've never once teased you about that. But, hey, uh, listen, tease away, man. That first miniseries, I still say I love that first miniseries. The second thing, the Wolverine Punisher thing, that's a whole other story, which is not appropriate topic for the, for this podcast, and, and I hate it. Snagoski still loves it, but I hate that second miniseries. But the first one, man, it's got the Son of Satan in it. It's drawn by Bernie Wrightson. It's got covers by Joe Jusko. It's inked by Jimmy Palmiotti. And and uh, and the story, by the way, fits continuity, and nobody was reading The Punisher at all. That's true. All of these things are true. All at of these all. things are true. Nobody was reading The Punisher, and we wrote a horror story with The Punisher um, and had a blast. And uh, and the best thing is the conversation that I have with Jimmy Palmiotti, and we really will get to the defenders in one second, but when uh, I got on the phone with Jimmy and we were talking about the uh, the series and how it was doing, and uh, and he said, well, see, the great thing about this series is that uh, no matter how many people may say they hate it, they're all reading it. And he said, issue three sold better than issue two, and issue four sold better than issue three, and that well, that's never... that's the opposite of what happens in comics, yeah, And he said, and that never happens. <laughs> so people may have hated our Punisher comic. And a lot of people loved it, by the way. I, I may see people all the time at Comic-Cons who love that, that miniseries. But uh, but a ton of people read that comic. So uh, even if they were hate-reading it, they were reading it. Yeah. You know, now, I know that this is Defender's Dialogue and not the horror show with Brian Keene, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you these two questions, which... I, I'm searching my mind. I don't think I've ever asked you these just when you and I are hanging out as friends okay. either. But, okay, question number one. When Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon reinvented the character with uh, Welcome Back Frank. Right. How did you feel about that one word balloon dismissal of, of Punisher's time with the Angels? Did you laugh or did it sting? Or? Uh, no, dude, not at all. I mean, uh, you know. Because we... I thought he handled it. With tact and you know it, it it fit the character. I thought you know I to I be spent honest, I was the... I was shocked that that they let Garth even acknowledge that that thing had happened. Yeah. So it didn't bother me at all. I mean, I don't know how Snagoski felt about it, but no, I I it didn't bother me at all. I was I was totally fine with it, and like I said, I really was. I was stunned that they didn't just ignore it. Yeah. Um, because that means that they did, you know, I mean, that means that technically it's in continuity, <laughs> um, which well, is, which is pretty damn funny. Um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, man, that was, so you had two questions you said. My other question then is I, now I know that much like myself, you're not real up to date on current Marvel, but no. Uh, I guess a year or two ago, they did a, a storyline called Frankencastle. Oh, yeah. You're so old, Brian. That was like six years ago or something. But was it ahead. really? I don't know how long ago, but it was a while. Oh, I thought that was fairly recent. Did, do you feel that uh, that you may have laid the groundwork for that? Um, I appreciated Frankencastle because it was dumber than what we did. <laughs> so... So I felt like Frankencastle gave us a little bit of like relief. Like people now could point to that and go, "That's the dumbest." Well, other than when they made the Punisher, uh, they they physically transformed him somehow into an African American guy. Right. They like put Frank Castle in an African American body. Oh, I've forgotten about that. Yeah. Other than that, Frankencastle is now the dumbest Punisher story. So that they can. But listen, the thing is, if you love Marvel continuity and you love seventies Marvel horror. Um, I don't understand how you could read our first four four issue Punisher miniseries and not enjoy it, um, right? Because it was totally. I mean, we worked really hard to make it in continuity. We explained everything, how it was possible, how it happened, and we did this really horrible horror story in in the context of the Punisher. Uh, that said, uh, when they went on to do the second one. We, we had this idea about what it was going to be, and then that's a topic for another day, but uh, if you ever want to talk about it on the horror show with Brian Keane, um, Punisher Wolverine Revelation was an absolute clusterfuck, um, that, and which was, and I will say, uh, not our fault. Uh, I yeah. love the first miniseries. The second miniseries is god-awful. Um, Snagoski 
still argues the point, but I just, I'm sorry, I hate it. Um, <laughs> but weirdly, the Punisher Wolverine Revelation has been reprinted and collected twice or three times. Three and times. The, and the first Punisher miniseries that we did has never been collected. Wow. Um, and I love it. I really, I still do. I mean, um, but anyway. Defenders. Well, should we, should, right now, people are like, well, what is this Punisher War, War Journal we tuned into? <laughs> um, they, uh, no, yeah, if you have, that's if a topic we, for another day. If you haven't watched it yet, folks, uh, stay home and watch Netflix's adaptation of The Punisher. The only other thing I want to say really quick, as as someone who has served, as someone who has a lot of friends who have served, um, I really appreciate what the showrunners have done in regards to PTSD. And and they they don't sensationalize it. Uh, it. It's probably one of the best depictions of it I've ever seen on screen. And and the the dialogue again, it's just it's very nuanced. It's very multifaceted. Uh, I haven't finished the series yet. You know, they 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 may end up blowing it, but so far it's 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 really good. I think I might like it better than even Daredevil. Cool. Well, Who I look is forward it, to watching it. I um, I also will say that uh, this, I think, is a preview for those of you who are listening. This is a preview for what this show is going to be like when we're done with the Defenders. <laughs> because we haven't, Brian and I have not had a private discussion about what we're going to cover, except to say we know, um, we, I'm sure we'll do the Champions. We'll probably do a lot of the weird one-off, like Son of Satan, Brother Voodoo, you know, the, the right. sort of things that uh, Morbius and Adventure into Fear, like stuff like that. Um, but uh, but we'll but we will see. We will see. But we anyway, see. Giant Size Defenders number five, Brian. That's uh, right. The start of the Guardians of the Galaxy multi-part crossover. Uh, if you listen to last week's episode uh, when, when we had Scott Edelman on, then uh, you heard a little bit about the creation of this book. Yeah, it's, it, it was a great conversation with Scott. And just to recap for people, this uh, issue, this giant size, was plotted by Steve Gerber, Jerry Conway, Roger Slifer, Len Wein, Chris Claremont, and Scott Edelman, and scripted by Gerber, uh, drawn by Don, uh, Drew, uh, excuse me, Don Heck, and inked by Mike Esposito. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, and Dave Hunt inked the backgrounds uh, yep. and lettered it. I mean, this was a, an all-hands-on-deck issue, as so often happened in those days. Um, we open with a typical Gerber scene of a bunch of street toughs uh, on a, a, a corner in Manhattan, um, and they're you know they're planning to do no no good. Right, uh, and then this this old man comes walking along. He's a he's a pawn shop proprietor. He's just closed up for the evening, and uh, these guys take him into an alley to mug him. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden, I think this is, you know, we have the street level scene and overhead, high overhead, unaware of the child's plight or the man named's name is child of child's plight. A decidedly different trio pursues a somewhat more elusive and esoteric objective. This being the trio being Dr. Strange, the Hulk and Valkyrie riding Aragorn. Um, right. And I think I want to pause on that panel because I think it, uh, it's an interesting contrast between the classic defenders that this show is about and the, the current modern day incarnation, perhaps best known from their Netflix series. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the defenders back then, they were never a street level team. Right. You know, uh, now uh, two episodes ago, we talked about the sons of the serpent storyline. Yeah. That, that took place at street level, but you know, m most of the, the threats they fought, uh, as you've seen so far, you know, Nebulon, the Celestial Man, Yandroth, the, the friggin' Headmen. <laughs> <laughs> These were not street-level threats. Um, so I, I just, yeah, I find that interesting. But, but yeah, uh, Doctor Strange has discovered temporal displacement vibrations <laughs> coming uh, from somewhere in the harbor around New York. And uh, he wants to find out what's causing them. Um, and as he's doing that, you see a, a ferry crossing the water and all of a sudden the water erupts around it. And what appears to be this massive school of fish begin attacking the <laughs> civilians on the ferry. 
and and of course, Brian, the the only thing to me that really matters on this two these two pages is this line uh, after the moment you just described. Hulk says, "So Hulk has to fight fish." Still sounds stupid to Hulk. <laughs> And then on the next page, the panel where Hulk is using his hand to sweep all the fish off the deck of the ferry and says, get back into water, dumb fish. Yeah. And this is, this is why you and I read this comic. It's exactly why. <laughs> it's exactly why. And, you know, Gerber's characterization of the Hulk, it's perfect. I do have to tell you, uh, in rereading this as an adult in preparation for the show, I miss Sal Buscema's renditions of the hulk it's don heck does a, a fine job right of drawing the book but it's jarring to hear that dialogue coming from you know something that salby schema clearly did not draw right yeah no it is it is interesting i mean uh that's the one effect well i mean i think for is a, a better artist than heck but it's uh you know it is a little distracting but in any case it still looks great um it, dr strange is flying over the water uh, Valkyrie discovers the fish are actually dead and being hurled as weapons at the ferry for some reason. Uh, Doctor Strange is flying over the water and is dragged into the water by Elar. Elar. A, a new addition to the Defenders Rogues Gallery. <laughs> Elar is a, a, a giant man-sized eel with uh, legs and arms like a human, but he's an eel. And, and fancies Elar, himself a god. Yeah, he, he, he speaks telepathically uh, basically anything you can find, uh, you know, that Steve Bannon has written for Breitbart or anything you might find at a, any Charlottesville <laughs> Nazi rally. Uh, yeah, here, here's an example of Elar's telepathic dialogue. Empire is the sole destiny of our race. We shall make any sacrifice, pay any price that that destiny be fulfilled. Um, you, you know, and that, so, will, that will all come into play later. It will. It's it, it's actually really clever here. What what Gerber or Edelman or whoever came up with, <laughs> and Edelman doesn't remember. But um, so then we get back to the street level where the three street toughs are menacing this guy, Mister Childs, uh, and they're uh, they're interfered with. They're beaten. They get the shit beaten out of them uh, by a, a a guy who looks like he just stepped out of one of my favorite haunts in P Town. Um. Charlie 27 of the Guardians of the Galaxy. That's right. Um, with Played his... by Ving Rhames in uh, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Exactly. I, I have to go back and look, but I don't think Ving Rhames had this outfit. He had the color scheme, but I don't think he had the outfit. The, 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 the two studded straps across his bare chest. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting... But anyway, so Charlie 27... Uh, what is it? He has 11 times the mass of an Earthman. Charlie 27 is the first member of the Guardians of the Galaxy that we see in this issue. Um, and what do you want to say about the Guardians? Uh, you know, the, this if, if the current on big screen rendition of the Guardians is not your father's Guardians of the Galaxy, well, well, this is. This is, this is my Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, exactly. This is the Guardians of the old men. Yeah. Um, the, you know, Guardians. Well, let's 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 cover the Guardians. Uh, the information about the Guardians when we get to that sort of flashback recap sequence. Okay. Uh, at this point, uh, Charlie Twenty Seven is in uh, is in sort of mystery and shadow here, uh, but he's thinking about um, how there's a little Bedoon uh, in all of us. The Bedoon yeah. being the evil race that has uh, uh, menaced the thirty first century. Yeah, we should point out that <clears throat> that. The this version of the Guardians of the Galaxy, they are from the future. Uh, they exist on 31st century Earth, which has been conquered and enslaved by an, uh, an alien race known as the Badoon. Um, this is actually the second invasion that's taken place on Earth, the first being the Martians. Okay, well, we're well, going to cover that. We're going to cover that. Oh, that's, yeah, that, that will be covered later. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so yes, for some reason, he, is, he has traveled back to 1970s New York City. And we'll discover. Yes, we'll discover right. that. So Elar is uh, is using his massive psychic powers apparently to uh, to rise up out of the ocean uh, and to to float or fly toward the city. To the cities, the centers of civilization must be first to fall, 
and that's they're all getting this psychic message. Um, we cut away to upstate New York, uh, and our friend Nighthawk. Um, Basically, a two-page recap of everything that's happened to him: the explosion, Trish Starr losing her arm, exactly uh, his betrayal by you know Penny's worth. Um, you exactly. know, and that's that's just a refresher sinister. as he's trying to figure out what to do with his life now. Right. Right. So, and, the, and there's a look up in the sky, Superman style moment. Um, and then we get to, uh, back to Manhattan. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the toll booth of the, uh, at the Hudson tunnel bridge or the Hudson tunnel, I should say. Uh, and the guards who are there, one of whom is clearly a, an NRA douchebag. Um, <laughs> Pardon me, Brian. I'm sorry that that just slipped out. I, you know, I I was in my youth a member of the NRA. I quit after Columbine uh, when when the the then president of the NRA uh, politicized the Columbine massacre. I, I said, well, I cannot in good conscience give you any money, and I haven't since. Uh, so yeah, feel free, fire away. Well, I found this. I found this very interesting, actually. Because one of the security guards, they're not supposed to have guns, according to the dialogue here, um, has a gun on duty and pulls it out and is uh, is basically pretending to be uh, Dirty Harry or something, yep. pointing his weapon at his fellow security guard, uh, brandishing it just to sort of, you know, pretend to be tough. Um, and he says, because he wishes he was a real cop, but he was not allowed to become a real cop. But and thanks to Elar, he gets his chance. Yes, yes. So then there's, uh, there's so go ahead. Yeah, Elar shows up. He perches atop the Hudson Hudson River Tunnel and begins attacking it with dead fish. <laughs> if this sounds ludicrous, you ought to see the artwork. You know? <laughs> yeah. But there's this this swarm of dead fish just just barreling into the the walls of the tunnel. And uh, the tunnel begins to to, to crash and, and cave in on itself. Yeah. And, the, and the tough guy freezes. Uh, it's the other guard who runs for help as the as the tough guy freezes, uh, not knowing how to handle this. Uh, and then, of course, thankfully for him, the defenders arrive. There's a hole in the tunnel, and the Hulk crumbles up a car and jams the car into the hole uh, to plug it up. So right. So, so just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, um, this is how Hulk solves the, instead of sticking his finger in the dike, he's, right. uh, yeah. We then have an interlude in, uh, Saugerties, New York. Yeah, which is uh, probably the most interesting part of this issue, by the way, this element. It, it is. Um, you know, we have this little boy, he's probably nine or ten years old, um, and it turns out he was among that crowd of people saying, look up in the sky at Nighthawk. And he runs home very excited. Um, he tells his mom and dad, I just saw a UFO, a flying saucer, a real one. It crashed. Uh, his parents, of course, don't believe him. Um, I identify with this kid. I used to make up stories like this to try to impress my parents, too. And my parents reacted in much the same way. They send him to his room. Um, he goes to his room. And you find out this kid idolizes, just idolizes Captain America. Um, he's got posters, he, he's he got, you know, figurines, models. This kid lives and breathes Captain America. Yeah, and this is this is the coolest, again, this is the, this is the element, the piece that I pull out of this story, aside from the first appearance uh, in this series of the Guardians and, and the, that it's the beginning of this sort of crossover with them, um, I love this element, this, you know, the, the family and all of this, and there's a reason for it, which we'll get to. By the way, he's 13, uh, although the, the yeah, art just, does make I him look younger. I saw that on the next page. Yeah. So, he, yeah, he, he decides what would Captain America do. Would he sit in his room grounded? No. He would sneak out and try to solve the mystery of this UFO. So that's exactly what the kid does. Uh, but Nighthawk has reached the UFO before this kid. Now, here's something odd. Uh, it is, in fact, a, a flying saucer. It bears a little bit of resemblance to the Star Trek Enterprise. More than a little. Yeah, yeah. and the, apparently the ship is named the Captain America. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is the ship 
from the future, the ship of the Guardians of the Galaxy, and then one by one, the remaining members of the Guardians uh, get off the ship. The first to get off is Major Vance Astro. This is we'll we'll share these descriptions. Uh, clad silver, uh, clad head to toe in a sheath of silver and black alloy, Major Vance Astro of the U.S. Air Force, who in 1988 will become the first Earthman to the stars, and as a result, the last survivor of the 20th century. He's uh, followed by Yondu, who mm-hmm. everyone knows from the movies, last of the barbaric blue-skinned natives of Centauri IV, the planet of Earth's first interstellar colony to be established in the dawning years of the 31st century. And then the third member of the ship's crew, perhaps the strangest of all, a humanoid composed entirely of silicon crystal, whose body can convert light waves into bursts of extreme heat and cold. He is Martinex, last survivor of Earth's outpost on Pluto. And I just, I want to, um, I just want to point out that I just think that Vance Astro as a character, I still feel, even though I read all of the ones that were done in the 90s and all of that, I feel like this is a character who is largely untapped. I so agree with the you. The future version of Vance Astro. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Uh, one of their most criminally underused characters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we then flash back to Times Square, where Elar is now attacking the city with his dead fish. Um, and apparently he now has the ability to... to send out electric bolts from his hands as well. Yeah, and and Charlie 27 has gone to the police to try to explain to them what happened to the old man, and uh, all they wanted to do was talk about his outfit. Um, and and now he's running away and they're shooting at him. Right. Um, uh, and and Elar, he, he continues with uh, the Hitler Youth speeches. He says, Die, Terran swine. Fall and burn before the might of your betters. In the galaxy, marching, killing, on world, star, and moon. Ours is the far-flung brotherhood of... But before he can finish it, Hulk interrupts him. <laughs> well, yeah, by jumping on his head, um, which is which is the best part. And then um, Hulk tells him, Elard better not get back up, or Hulk will break every bone in his body, if his body has any bones. Uh, <laughs> Elard ignores Hulk. He just continues with the with the, the Breitbart propaganda. <laughs> well, and the best part is, Hulk at this point is just hitting him because he wants him to shut up. Right. <laughs> and he yells, shut up at him. This is the yes, the, the continuation. Um, yeah, so Valkyrie tries to attack, uh, to attack. She's downed by Elar's electrical charge because, oh, we forgot to mention, he's, uh, he's not just uh, an eel character. He's an electric eel character. Right. Um, Hulk is pissed, of course, because he's harmed Valkyrie. Um, Not and, only has he harmed Valkyrie, he's harmed Valkyrie's horse, Aragorn, as well. Oh, yeah. And, um, and that and will Hulk, not stand. <laughs> yeah, when Hulk hits him, uh, he burns himself because the electrical charge seems to be even more powerful than they thought. Um, so then Doctor Strange tries magic on him. Yeah. And we find that Vance, or excuse me, not Vance, Charlie 27 is now in the crowd of onlookers watching right. the Defenders fight. And he's he's just astounded by it. So we when we cut back to um, Saugerties, New York, uh, you know, on board the Captain America, the other Guardians are explaining everything to Nighthawk. And he is actually persuaded. He believes their story about being from the future. Um you know, all of that, and and they're making a plan for Martinex to sen- essentially teleport them uh, to Charlie 27's aid. Uh, and once that happens, Martinex is alone on the ship, and the boy we saw, the 13-year-old boy we saw earlier, uh, who snuck out, uh, basically has walked onto the ship, because, of course, it's not, <laughs> it's not shielded or hidden in any way, and the door is wide open, and the ramp is down. <laughs> So he just walks on board. Um, this is uh, this is what I guess what happens when you're from the 31st century and you don't understand what that people live in the suburbs. Um, yeah. So, so then, then we the, get uh, back to we get back to Times Square where uh, Doc and Hulk and Valkyrie are now joined by Yondu, Vance, Astro, and Nighthawk. 
And then Charlie 27 makes himself known as well. And we have the first official meeting of the Defenders and the Guardians of the Galaxy. But while they're saying hello, uh, Elar escapes, flies into the sky. Right. I, I, I think it's interesting because uh, this is the second time that Doc, I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was when they uh, momentarily teamed up with the Wrecking Crew. We have this 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 moment repeated where Doctor Strange is talking to these strangers who've arrived who seem to be allies, and he turns around and they're gone. Yeah, <laughs> I just think that's funny. I don't know. It amuses I me. Do I do too. So they uh, that Hulk and uh, Doctor Strange and Valkyrie go off in pursuit of uh, Elar. I guess Nighthawk goes with them as well. Um, and meanwhile, the the Guardians go back to this alley where the whole thing started, where those street toughs were, were robbing the old man. And uh, they find that in the old man's suitcase uh, is... Is the MacGuffin. Yeah, the thing that they have traveled across the centuries to find. Exactly. Some kind of helmet. And yep. uh, Charlie puts it on, and we, we find out that it's a genuine Badoon Mento programmer. But its tapes are empty, blank, and they've come all this way for nothing. <laughs> so, it, the, the tapes are blank now, but they weren't always blank. Or Dr. Right. Strange actually finds another, apparently another, uh, one of these similar helmets. Uh, and uh, should we just cut to the chase here, Brian, and explain what the hell is going on? We, we should. <laughs> we, on the next page, Elar ignores the defenders and decides to fight a tree. Okay, at which point the defenders discover out discover that Elar was once a normal little electric eel swimming in the Hudson Bay, and then he came in contact with this helmet, and the the Breitbart propaganda that he's been spouting, it's all Badoon propaganda. This is they they put these helmets on people and enslave them and brainwash them into serving them. So this eel has been spouting Badoon propaganda, which again. Which actually, as as much as this whole thing is executed uh, in a sort of silly way that's all about creating the fights, um, it's really a cool idea, you know? I mean, it's, yeah, it is. you look at it fundamentally from the perspective of, hey, you know, the Bedoon are the weirdly amphibious, horrifying, uh, you know, conquering alien race from the 31st century or the 30th century, and they're... Uh, you know, and this item was used to to brainwash people into in, and enslaving them, um, which is sort of what Sinclair Broadcasting will be once this new FCC rule goes into place. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's fascinating that uh, that that's the plot behind it, and that somehow uh, an ordinary electric eel has been transformed into this monster. And yet again, it's that thing where you know they were probably come up coming up with the plot that they wanted to use, but they were like, "What well, do you have? They have to fight something." You know, right? It feels like it. They, it was reverse engineered to create the monster for them to fight. You know, it does. It does. And fight they do. The Guardians and the Defenders team up. They defeat Elar. Doctor Strange turns him back into a normal eel, and they return him to the sea. Which brings us to the end of Giant Size Five. You have the Guardians and the Defenders back once again at Doctor Strange's Sanctum Santorum, um, and. Vance Astro is is explaining everything to the defenders about how the the bad Badoon conquered Earth in three thousand seven A.D. and you know they're freedom fighters, they're guerrilla fighters, in fact, uh, you know, striking back at the Badoon. Meanwhile, back at the at the Captain America spaceship, uh, Martin X is talking to this thirteen year old boy who mentions that one day he wants to be an astronaut. And we learn that his name is, in fact, Vance Astro, which is, of course, the, the character from the Guardians of the Galaxy, the yeah. leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. So and, now uh, we have... Uh, so it's a great... It's, that, to me, is the best part of this issue, is that story. Right. Um, the setup for it. And then uh, I have to say that uh, moving on to Defenders 26... Um, which continues and guest stars the, the Guardians. This, to me, is the best part of this arc. Um, 
You mean this sequence here between Valkyrie No, no, this and... this issue is the best part of the arc for me for okay. a couple of reasons which we'll which we'll get to. Um written by Gerber, um the artists are Sal Buscema and Vince Coletta. <clears throat> um and I do love the the opening here, Brian. It opens with uh with Valkyrie sitting on a cliff talking to Jack Norris, who is the husband of the woman whose body she inhabits. Um, and he just, he still just doesn't get it, Brian. He's like, he doesn't, we owe it to ourselves, Barbara, to try living together again. We loved each other. And she's like, dude, <laughs> let me remind you, I'm not her. I'm in her body, but I'm not her. Um, now I, I mentioned two podcasts ago when, when Jack made his first appearance during the sons of the serpent saga, um, he, he really does become an unofficial member of the defenders he's he's on the book throughout gerber's run yeah, for uh sure. he's there he's there after gerber's run but he he has the unenviable position of you know he this woman who he believes still believes in his heart of hearts is his wife um you know she she possesses an enormous staggering power and her friends her teammates the people in her life also have amazing abilities and powers. He's just a normal man. Right. Um, and, and yet he sticks it out and he, he's always trying to measure up to them later on. That will lead to all kinds of problems. Yeah. But, uh, I, he, he's one of my favorite characters in this series. Well, what's interesting is they give him, it's an interesting story. And if you think about the time that the story was told in, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting story that, you know, you've got this guy who's, you know, it's the it's the story of the woman who discovered, you know, I am woman, hear me roar. <clears throat> and her husband is like, but you should be cooking me dinner. And right. And he loves her, but he's also definitely like not he doesn't understand this new imbalance in their relationship. No, he um, doesn't. But he comes to understand it. And that's actually what I think is really interesting about the story. Um, You know, he's he's you know, she saves his life in this scene. He there's an earthquake. Uh, the cliff crumbles. He falls and she's hops on Aragorn's back and and saves him. Um, anyway, then we go to a great um, almost a splash page. There's an inset page with uh, Doctor Strange doing the stroking his chin, thinking. Um, but a, a, otherwise, a great splash page of uh, Hulk and Vance Astro and Charlie Twenty Seven, Nighthawk and Doctor Strange and Yondu around the around a table, um, you know, sort of deciding what to do next. Right. Um, and what they've discovered is that is that Earth's weather has gone completely haywire. Um, you know, it's the, the the temporal displacement caused by the Guardians of the Galaxy appearing in this time. Right. Um, and Hulk doesn't understand any of this. Hulk doesn't get it. How can men be from tomorrow when it's still tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also partly uh, it's it's the temporal displacement in general of their being there, but. Uh, the main factor in that Dr. Strange believes is the fact that Vance is here in this time and exists as a child in this time as well. Exactly. Um, so, you know, no one may occupy two spatial points at the same moment in eternity yet you do. Um, and then they're like, we've got to get you to your ship and get you out of here. But of course the ship is now surrounded by the military and the media. Um, and then, Martinex and young Vance Astro step out of the ship uh, in, in a scene that is reminiscent of so many great classic 1950s science fiction movies. Um, the day the earth stood still among them, I felt. Uh, and Vance of the future recognizes his young self and realizes, like, he says, Dr. Strange, do something. And and Strange does. He teleports the Captain America <coughs> and young Vance and Martin X to uh, Nighthawk's, <laughs> Nighthawk's estate. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, where everybody is reunited and they, they all catch up and, and Vance tells old Vance, tells young Vance and the Defenders about, you know, life in the, the 31st century. Um, you know, the, the ozone layer finally collapsed. Uh, now, I, I I don't know that we need to go over all this, but I do want to point out what Gerber did here. Um, yeah, me too. This is this is again. This is one of the reasons, other than uh, the thing with Jack Norris, this sort of two pages or four pages is the reason I love this issue. Exactly. Seventies you know, Marvel comics, not so much these days, but for so 
much time. Marvel Comics was built on continuity. Everything mattered, everything connected. And, you know, as a young as a young kid reading these in the 70s, that was magical to me. Um, but they started of, to experiment in the 70s. Right. They, they experimented, you know, they would do horror titles, they would do science fiction titles. Well, you've got these three very different sci-fi titles all taking place in the future of the Marvel Universe, and they didn't seem to match up. You had Deathlock, right. uh, who's this killer cyborg, you know, in a, in a, a world controlled by corporations. Uh, you had Killraven, who is basically a... A barbarian fighting the Martians. The premise was, you know, the Martians lost the War of the Worlds, but then they returned. Two, and two of my all time favorite series. Right. And then, you know, third, you have Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, and Earth is enslaved by the Badoon. And and none of this ever matched up continuity wise until this issue of the Defenders, where in two pages, Steve Gerber ties the timeline together. It, it it starts with the collapse of the ozone layer, which leads to the corporations taking over and, you know, Deathlock's era. Um, it, well, it leads to people having, uh, you know, having their limbs amputated and replaced by bionic limbs, which right. leads to the cyborgs, uh, which is part of Deathlock's era and Deathlock being a cyborg. Right. Um, and then the, there's bionic wars and uprisings. Uh, but humanity comes to its senses, and they start to rebuild, and they, they build the first confederation of nations, and everything is going great all of a sudden. And then, in 2001, they're invaded by the Martians. Right. And, and you know, civilization collapses, but uh, that's where Killraven and, and all the characters from his series come in. They fight back, uh, they defeat the Martians, and then, you know, the next 500 years... It's a barbaric period. Basically, Earth has to rebuild civilization from from jump, you know. Um, but they get there, and everything's rebuilt, and they're traveling to the stars, and that brings us to the era of the Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, we're colonizing other planets. Everything's going great. Uh, then the Badoons show up and fuck up everything once again. There you go. Well, so, again, I just love the uh, – I also like to point out that um, – one of my favorite guardians was always Nikki, who's not in this series, um, but her race is shown in, uh, in this issue as well. Right. Yep. She didn't come along until the '90s series, correct? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure she appears before that. Um, Does she? Okay. Yeah, but I uh, I do love that character. We'll have to we'll have to look it up. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, yeah, she's um, from Mercury, I think, but I'm not. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. Um. Anyway, so they explain all the characters. They explain Vance Astro arriving in 3006. He landed um, after being in this suit on his ship in probably some hibernated state for a thousand years, uh, only to discover that all his sacrifices were for nothing because shortly after he left, all this other shit happened and hu the hu humanity has been, you know, uh, roaming the stars for centuries before he arrives. Right. Um, which is, again, why I think he's such a fascinating character. I agree. I agree. Um, so, you know, he, he's he's told this story. Uh, young Vance Astro is, you know, he's, he's quite upset by this. Um, and uh, Doctor Strange removes any memory of young Vance Astro meeting the Defenders or his older self. And then um, sends young Vance home. Yep. Um, meanwhile, while all that was going on, Hulk and Charlie 27 fixed the Captain America with their fists. And I'm not making that <laughs> up. Uh, it's Charlie like when the TV is on the fritz and you whack it. Well, yeah. we don't do that anymore. He's, but He says, the old, Hulk so. and I hammered out the dents with our fists. <laughs> <laughs> um. And then that's basically it. That's essentially the whole the whole issue, except that at the end, uh, they all board the ship because Doctor Strange and the Defenders decide they're going to go, they're going to join the Guardians, and they go to the future to help them defeat the Badoon. Right. Which is, which, is a, which is an unexpected twist for those of us who are reading this comic at the time. You're like, wait, the Defenders are going to leave Earth now to defend Earth a thousand years from now. Um, but also super cool. So not only are the Guardians technically members of the Defenders, 
the defenders are technically members of the Guardians of the Galaxy, at least these four primary defenders. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, which brings us to Defenders 27, one of my favorite, very favorite covers uh, from the Bronze Age. Oh, Marvel yeah, for comic, sure. Uh, which is, is Hulk and an unconscious Valkyrie and Doctor Strange in a swamp. It looks like Man-Thing's swamp. Um, and uh, there's just these, these savage, hairy, amphibious creatures attacking them. And uh, the word balloon from Doctor Strange is, the Badoon women are far more savage than their men. Unless I strike swiftly, Hulk and Valkyrie are doomed. <laughs> so, so we have, uh, again, written by Gerber, again, drawn by Buscema and Coletta. Um, it's planet Earth, 3015 AD. Uh, and we begin with the, the classic uh, Badoon looking at their view screen on their ship. Uh, seeing the this is not the USS Enterprise flying <laughs> through space, and, and and the henchman is is upset because they're back. Um, so basically, he's uh, he's dispatched crafts to intercept the Captain America. Right, and on board the Captain America, Hulk is is still very very confused <laughs> by everything that's going on. Uh, they want to teleport. Uh, Yondu, Vance Astro, Valkyrie, and Hulk down to Earth. And Martin X is trying to explain it to him. Um, and he can't get through. And Doctor Strange can't get through to him. And Nighthawk can't get through to him. Charlie 27 seems to be able to get through to him. Yeah, right. Um, you know, calms him down enough to let them teleport. Uh, and they do. Uh, but as they're doing that... Uh, the Badoon attack the Captain America, and it, it messes up the teleportation beam, sending them uh, into the trackless void of subspace, uh, which means they're, they're, they're now lost in the universe. At which point we find out that Jack Norris stowed away aboard the Captain America and has also come to the future, <laughs> and he demands to know what has happened to his wife. I want to know what you've done with my wife. Uh, this, is, this is perhaps... Not the dumbest thing Jack Norris will do, but the dumbest thing he's done up until this point. Right. Um, uh, so and, Valkyrie and where, and where is his wife, Chris? Yeah. Well, Valkyrie and Vance Astro are find themselves uh, knee deep in what appears to be a blood swamp. It's not blood, but it's red. Um, and and uh, Vance recognizes that they're not on Earth because there are two moons in the sky. It's a good indicator. And then they are they are set upon. By what we now know, and we'll we'll jump to the to the chase here. Cut to the chase. See, I'm tired as well, Brian. <clears throat> we now know are the females of the Badoon species, right? And uh, we know that because when Valkyrie tries to fight them, she's overcome with nausea, as you know from from previous episodes. She's forbidden to fight women. If she does, she gets weak and sick. Yeah, and, she says it is right. as if I'd inflicted the fatal wound upon myself. And she's in such pain that she can't stand uh, stand up, and she collapses into the uh, into the swamp. Um, they fight them off. Well, they cut to the chase. They fight them off, and they are uh, then approached by a glowing golden form uh, who aids them, which we'll get to in a moment, and who who we will get to in a moment, and we will soon discover is one of the most irritating characters ever created. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, so then we get back, and, and Jack Norris is still shouting, and he's got a wrench in his hand, an ordinary wrench that apparently in the 31st century is still what you use to fix things on your spaceship. Or you can use your fists, as we learned yeah. in the previous <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, you let this rock-headed freak get away with murder, uh, Jack shouts. Uh, so Doctor Strange has to freeze Jack. Uh, so he can't, or paralyze him so that he can't attack them any further. Right. And uh, then we find out where Hulk and Yondu have gone. They have they have not gone to the planet of the Badoon women. Um, they materialize in what seems to be medieval Europe somewhere, uh, except that everybody's dressed like hipsters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this uh, is... This is... Uh, pretty interesting. I want to point out one quick thing here, and then we'll we'll skip ahead. Obviously, Brian, we're not going to get nearly as much uh, covered this episode as we thought. 
I, no. I would just like to point out that unlike the Yondu in the Guardians of the Galaxy films, uh, this Yondu has uh, quite a, a large red fin on his head. Uh, and as such, Hulk's nickname for him is Flaghead. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because we, we need to keep track of all flag, uh, Hulk's nicknames for people. Um, so <laughs> go ahead. Then, then they're attacked by these robot guys that Hulk refers to as Tin Men and smashes them. And then we discover that they're actually a sentient race of robots and the, their mom shows up and she's pissed because he killed her babies. Yep, she, she says she she looms over Hulk and Yondu, and she says, "You killed my babies, and by doing so, you have sealed your fate. You are judged guilty and hereby placed in thrall." And she paralyzes Hulk and Yondu, much in the same way Doctor Strange paralyzed Jack. Which brings us back to the Captain America once again. Right, where where Martin X has hooked Doctor Strange into the Captain America's computer systems. To that amplify like his good, powers yeah. so that for some reason, somehow now, Doctor Strange is going to be able to use his powers and the ship's computer systems to search the entire galaxy for their, their allies. Right. Because that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? They don't have Cerebro and, and Professor X, so right. this is their, their, uh, their version of that. Uh, as an interesting side effect, it, it short-circuits the controls on the Badoon ship that was attacking them. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a bonus. Um, so then we, we cut back to the swamp world, uh, where the glowing figure has a cave that he's led Vance to and, uh, the injured Valkyrie and, and he, he, you know, Vance is worried. He's, he's like, look, Valkyrie's lost a lot of blood. You have any medical supplies and the glowing figure heals her with light that she may rise into the world whole once more. Um, and the glowing figure is, of, should we, should we say yes, who it the glow, is? The glowing figure is of course, Starhawk, AKA one who knows. Right. And the interest Starhawk has, has a, a bunch of facets here. We'll go, since we know we're not going to get much, you know, much further this episode, we'll go, we'll just talk a little bit about Starhawk. Starhawk is at, at once, uh, an incredibly 1970s character. There's a very, uh, uh almost like. Uh, should be the figurehead of a cult, um, you know, attitude, very sort of hippie-ish. Um, and Marvel had a lot of those. Yes, Remember Marvel did had... in the 70s, uh, both both villains and heroes, a lot of these yeah. characters who who talked like this and, and had this uh, greater aesthetic. Um, and at the same time, so there's... Starhawk is annoying as fuck. He is. <laughs> okay? Uh, be- particularly because... He's one of those characters like the Watcher who knows things that he won't tell you. He could tell you and it would help you to know them, but he won't, he doesn't want, he's not supposed to, the cosmic uh, powers are not supposed to uh, let him interfere with whatever he knows. Um, However, I will say that the one super interesting thing about Starhawk is that Starhawk, uh, we won't discover here, but it's intimated during this story and we'll learn much more about it later. Starhawk is actually a merger between, uh, uh, a man and his wife, uh, as well as um, some kind of cosmic force. Um, and so Starhawk, although presenting male here and female at other times, with uh, his wife is Alita, um, you, you basically discover that Starhawk has no gender or, yeah, it, or was, shifts he was, gender. He was the first non-binary character in comics yeah. that, I, that I can think of. Yeah. Um, which makes it just even funnier. You know, he's, he's this... He, she, well, I don't know. He's a he right here. We'll he's say a he, he right now. now. So, uh, you know, first non-binary character in comics possesses, you know, cosmic knowledge on the scale of like the Watcher or Galactus. Right. And yet in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he's portrayed by Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting. Um. Anyway, then we get to the to the point where we see that Hulk and Yondu have been captured, um, and this planet basically, you know, it, here's all I want to say about this planet. I think Brian, like, um, shall we shall we forge ahead and do the next issue? Or? No, I I think this is a good place to stop because it does stop on a cliffhanger. But okay. talk about the planet first. Uh, all I want to say about the planet, and this is why I want to 
is is it's basically a combination of what you all just saw in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, um, with the uh, um, uh, God, the the the, what, the, what was the Grandmaster character right. played by Jeff Goldblum, um, and uh, the people who can't walk in Wally. <laughs> <laughs> Because the basically the whole planet is people who are so uh, um, taken care of and looked after, uh, mostly the men that they've grown like fat and soft and just lay around all the time, um, the way that the rest of the world perceives all Americans at this point, um, and uh, and they want things for their entertainment. Right. So it is this w- interesting combination, as you said. It also sort of uh, sets up. It's a sort of precursor to. Um, the Planet Hulk storyline in some ways, but we'll get to that right. in the next episode. Um, because at the end of this issue, while Doctor Strange is still tapped into the Captain America's onboard computer, uh, Martin X and Nighthawk and Charlie 27 gasp as the Badoon, the Badoon elite guard, nonetheless, uh, storm the Captain America and confiscate it in the name of of the Brotherhood of the Badoon. To be exactly. continued, true believers. Exactly, to be continued. So uh, we, we got two, ep- two issues shorter, uh, or two fewer issues covered in this episode than we expected. Uh, but we will do 28, 29, and 30 in the next episode, as well as, most certainly, at least a couple of other issues. Uh, maybe more, I'm looking now, but certainly we'll do uh, 31 and 32, and we'll see what else we get from there. Uh, you know, we, we probably could have done another episode or issue or two, uh, if, if not for the 10 minutes we spent discussing the Punisher. Exactly. Um, but, uh, in any case, Excelsior, true believers. Excelsior, true believers. And one more time, we just want to remind folks that Defender's Dialogue is available on iTunes, Android, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Folks, if you like Defender's Dialogue, even if you're listening to it on Stitcher or Google Play Music or you know just on your computer, um, if you have access to iTunes, do us a favor. Go subscribe. You don't have to download it every week. Just subscribe. That helps us out in the rankings. Uh, and if you do subscribe, maybe take the time to leave us a five-star review. I um, also want to remind you that our engineer is Tommy Clark, and he has a podcast also available on the Project Entertainment Network. It's called the Necrocasticon. Uh, we encourage you to check that out. And, yeah, uh, should we excel your true believers again, or is that enough? Oh, should I think, I think if Marvel? we did it one more time, people would cry. I think that's enough Excelsior true believers for this episode. We'll see you next time, Marvelites. What kind of stars can you hear each week on the Curtain Jerkers Wrestling Podcast? Booker Max Burton proceeds over our panel of wrestling analysts. Ring announcer Walter Ball. South Florida indie correspondent Steve Mesa. Northeast indie correspondent The Viking Brian Burton. Classic feuds dissected. Fridays at 6.05 on Superstation P.E.N. This has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 